This meeting is being recorded. Yes. Yeah. Mm. All right, everybody. Welcome to um, our first meeting for 2022. I think we've got a 17 people on, I think. Mm -hmm. That's not too, it's not too bad, probably for a January meeting. Um, as as uh, it was advertised in the syllabus, um, it's Meet Your Council. Our council of... Uh, prepared six sheets and I think um, everyone's going to be really uh, oh what can I explain there's a, there's a diverse um, <laughs> there's diverse presentations so um, without any further ado I think we'll start and uh, Bill Clark is our first uh, presenter go Bill Bill hi hello everybody um my, my six pages are really diverse in the, uh, in the range of things. Uh, this one I thought I'd start off with because it's plague mail. And uh, it's sent from Constantinople to, uh, to Cologne when Constantinople was uh, uh, in a plague. And uh, they punctured holes in it and then put powder in it and then put the uh, hand stamp down the bottom left corner to indicate that it had been disinfected. And you can see the, the holes. Uh, there's one in the middle of the five. Uh, then there's another one uh, at the H at the beginning of the name. And the third one is at the base of the first three of 33. So, uh, but I just thought, yeah, it's nice to know that even back in 1799, they were having the same problems we're having. So, <laughs> so the world continues. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll go to the next one now. Yeah, this one, I, I love it because it's Melbourne, New South Wales. And uh, yeah, I just love that. I love showing it to people who aren't from that lists and it confuses the hell out of them. Uh, I know it's not rare, but... Uh, and uh, nice. it's a nice item and, and it confuses non philatelists which I, I love <laughs> doing. And, uh, and it was uh, sent to London, but when it got there, uh, the, the pe person had moved to Malta. And so they redirected them to Malta, but just Malta, no other clue. So I assume that it did find the, the right person. So uh, it's just a, a nice item. And, uh, and then the next one, yeah, it, it's a rubbish envelope, I'll be honest. Uh, it, it's got nothing going for it, except I noticed the name of the recipient, Francis Hanty. And uh, I remember from my school days learning about the Hanty setting up the first sheep farm in in Victoria, which we all realised was actually New South Wales. And, uh, and it was the wife who helped set up that first farm. And, uh, and by the time this was sent to her, she was living in Portland because the, the town had grown. Uh, and, uh, and she was actually the one, the husband went across uh, to, to Victoria or New South Wales as it was then and established the farm and sent the boat back for the wife and she came a month later with um, the, the first of the Merino sheep to come to New South Wales. So uh, I just thought it, it's, okay. it's, not, it's a nice piece of history, even though it's nothing special. So we'll go to the, the next one. Now, this one's interesting because it, it's from the diggings and uh, and there was no post offices out in the diggings and out in the gold fields. And so there was an enterprising uh, um, stationer who would, for a shilling, take your letter to the post office. And he put his, his hand stamp on it to, to help promote his service probably. Um, and, but the post office didn't like him making a shilling when they were only getting four pence. And, uh, and considered he was challenging their, their monopoly. So uh, they, they stopped it. So it didn't last very long. And it's claimed that there's only two known examples of that hand stamp 
Whether that's right or not, I don't know. But, but it's nice to say that it's claimed. And, and then this next one, it's, I, I love it because it's from the Austro-Hungarian consulate in Melbourne. Uh, and I just love that concept of uh, all the embassies being in Melbourne. And why were all the embassies in Melbourne in 1913? Because Melbourne was the capital of Australia. And it still is. <laughs> it still is. <laughs> and I, I just love that it was, uh, was the capital for so long. Um, and, uh, and so that, that's why I like that one. Plus, it's the transitional period where you could use state stamps alongside um, federal stamps. So um, it's just an interesting thing there. And, and then the last one, it's addressed to Her Highness Joan the Wad uh, in England. Now, who's, who, she is the Queen of the Pixies. And, uh, and I just like the concept of this was written to the Queen of the Pixies to ask for help with something. And I think the trouble we've been in the last two years, we should be writing to the Queen of the Pixies again because she'll light her wad and light, and light the way through. Um, so whether or not that's true, I don't know. But uh, yeah, it's just nice to know that uh, there is a Queen of the Pixies somewhere out there. And, uh, and so that's that's my six. And as I said, they're all quite diverse in themselves. And uh, I hope you enjoy them as much as I enjoy having them. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Bill. Any okay. questions or comments in regards to Bill's presentation? None? Oh, good. All right. Well, next is Alan Shatton. And Alan's not here, so I'll try and go through Alan's <laughs> presentation. Um, Alan's got a very, um, well, you know, present, uh, slides, and uh, his slides is uh, uh, his presentation is instructional and unusual markings of uh, Tasmanian postal markings. I should have got I should have got you to do this, Malcolm. All right, the first one, first present, the first slide is uh, the return to sender, which is the the big hand um, rubber hand stamp there in red. Um, and uh, and also the you know, cannot be found, which is a line hand stamp, which is there. If you see if my one pointing, and both of these type of stamps, uh, hand stamps are rare, rare, um, very rare. The bottom is a, a not known box for the postman's records, which is that big blue hand stamp, which was used uh, at Launces and. In Beaconfield and Beaconsfield, and there's only seven copies known. So, you know. next is a postcard from Humanville to Hythe, which is situated in the far south of um, uh, Tasmania, and it's an and a postcard's got an unstamped 2D to pay uh, stamp, which is that there, and. Uh, and which has got a one one postage, you know, to pay. Oh, the next one is uh, a letter from Bernie to Axminster in England. And this address is uh, address that is not known. So the letter was returned to uh, Launceston, and in that process, and it, it went to the dead letter letter office, and down the bottom. On the right hand side, on data bottom in the middle, you can see Dead Letter Office, Tasmania. Uh, it's a double R rating, and it's and it's seven years it's seven years earlier than uh, the previous earliest recorded date. So uh, Alan's done pretty well in getting that. And the next one is a TML TML railway number three uh, postmark postmark, you know, which was used on. On the main line between Hobart and Tasmania, it's a late, um, it's a late letter to pay. Uh, generally, gen generally, you could um, 
<coughs> excuse me, generally you could uh, uh, post letters late and uh, they, had, they had a one, you know, had normally had a surcharge, which in this case it had a one penny to uh, pay. Uh, this, this hand stamp you know, is very rare and there's only one known. Copy nine when when Green's books volume two was published. I don't know what that means, and uh, and it's been used from 18th of March 1903 to 31st of December 1904. And this is a, uh, a loose ship's letter uh, hand stamp. It's a letter from Victoria to Warnsworth in February 1900. Um, the loose ship's letter was applied to uh, letters for visiting ships. To that were uh, prepaid but had to not to be cancelled, and it was used. And this actual letter was um, used in Launceston and made it. Oh, this uh, hand stamp was used in Launceston from 1888 to 1914. And the last, I think this is the last one to post it out of course hand, um, hand stamp, which, which was applied to uh, letters posted in the wrong letterbox when different boxes were in use for different destinations. So as a result, delivery might have been delayed and the example is used only in law and system <coughs> and there and there are only two other examples known. All right, that's Alan's one done. So I think next Gary Diffin. Well, if there's any questions, ask ask Malcolm. <laughs> well actually <laughs> I collect these uh Frank so I knew all about these things. Uh, all right Gary, you're up next. Um, just a bit of a precursor. This uh, this is a collection that's actually never been exhibited. Part of it has, but not the whole lot. Uh, this is US brewery advertising envelopes. And the, the these are dated in the 1870s. And what you find in, you know, back in the 1870s, uh, uh, this is the beginning of brewing, not the beginning of brewing a beer, but you couldn't, if you were a brewer, there was no refrigeration here, no refrigeration cars. So the, the brewery actually existed in one city and for it to, to go from say Melbourne to Sydney, for example, you, won't be able, you wouldn't be able to ship your, your, your beers purely because uh, they would go rotten. So they had to wait until um, refrigeration was born. So, so for the US, these, these early advertising envelopes from about the pre-1880, uh, they're they very fanciful. And so it's good to know that, you know, when you had advertising back then, you know, advertising now means totally different things, but advertising back then, there wasn't a lot of availability of what you could do. So you had the ability to um, advertise in a newspaper, for example, there was no television, there was no radio or anything like that. And the other way that they were able to advertise who they were and what they did was on postal envelopes and the, the United States were by far and wide the best at doing this. Now, this brings us to the Bergner and Engel Brewery. So this brewing company actually produced about half a dozen um, advertising envelopes during the 1870s. All of them were printed on the reverse. And if you look at these two envelopes, you think, gee, you know, this seems to be a really large brewing operation. And as you can see in both of these envelopes, they've got two different types of illustrations or two different illustrations of what this brewery looks like. Well, it's good to know that things haven't changed from the 1870s through to 2022. This is all a fabrication. The brewery was actually much, much smaller and it was actually one of the smaller uh, factories within this conglomerate. So what the brewery is actually, brewer is actually saying is that my, I've got a really, really large brewery and this is the size of my brewing operation. Or in actual fact, it was probably about 20% a, 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 a of the size of one of these and it was a small factory. So they kept on advertising say, hey, I'm a really big brewer, but in actual fact, they were pretty tiny. Next one there, please, Frank. Um, this is a, a, another all over 1870s um, brewing advertising cover. And what you said, what, what I like about this particular one is that uh, you've got the internal uh, illustrated uh, letter sheet that goes with it. And usually these were the invoices that they would sell, uh, that would send to the pubs. And it's interesting to note that the illustrated letter sheet that's uh, in, inside the envelope 
is also the same as what's on the front of the envelope. Next one, Frank. Um, the Crescent Brewery, uh, they were also uh, one of the prolific um, advertisers during the 1870s. The, these early eight, 1870s run are very, very scarce, but there's a couple of brewers that were um, uh, prolific and the Crescent Brewery was one of them. They tended to have about four or five different um, uh, advertising envelopes. And as you can see in this illustration, the, the one on the front on the, at the top is totally different to the brewery at the bottom. Another pre fabrication of saying, my brewery is really, really big, which in actual fact, it was actually pretty, pretty small. Next one, Frank. Um, these are another uh, all over advertising. The, the top one, Frederick Laura, he was, uh, they had a, another series of envelopes of which he was very prolific. And they're probably the most common envelopes that you find. This other one, which you see here, is the only example that I've seen. And uh, it's a very scarce example from this particular brewery. And the one at the bottom, which is the, the Phoenix Steam Brewery, that's the only other example I've seen. And it's interesting to note that it's actually been used to Germany as well. Next one, Frank. Um, the, this is another Phoenix Steam Brewery, but it's located in a different city. Um, these, uh, these pink envelopes are very, very scarce. Uh, and I can't remember which one, one of them's the only one I've known, I've seen, and the other ones, there's about two or three that I've seen. They're, uh, the illustrations that you see in, in the circle, or sorry, the oval at the lower left are actually different breweries, but they're advertising the same brewery. So there's different illustrations there. Finally, the next one, Frank. Um, Probably the, we'll go to the bottom one, which is uh, the Schmidt Brewing. You see a couple of these around, so that's not the rarest uh, example that you'll see. But then again, if you look at the illustration, it's another fabrication. The US, okay, nothing's changed. They, they, they're brilliant at advertising, promoting themselves and being bigger and bolder than what they already are. And uh, that's the end of my brewing advertising, a little bit of history of brewing in the United States. Okay, thanks, Gary. Any questions or comments for Gary? Someone's got the television on. Hang on, I'll see if I can find the culprit. <laughs> I, need find, I need to find the culprit and mute him. <laughs> Mute the lot, Frank. It's Eric and Troy Lane. That's the one that keeps on coming. Yeah, up. yeah no, I've, I've just muted him. Okay, next one is uh, Ted Gallagher. Ted. Are right, you... I, I'm right now, I think. Yep, now we can now, hear. I did write an article uh, in the September issue of Philately from Australia on this stamp. Uh, it was mainly covering the development of the design. I did challenge the origin of the design in the article, proposing that it was from Daryl Lindsay's oil painting of Driver Returns, <coughs> which is the one shown there, rather than Lindsay's watercolour of the Overlanders, as reported in the post office bulletin of the time, and subsequently ended up in the specialist catalogue. Nobody's challenged my assertion in that article. Uh, next one, please. Frank, thank you. I did refer to three types of cliches, but didn't include images, uh, which you can now see. The differences are particularly evident in the horse's mane and ears. It was originally thought that there must be three dyes. However, Jeff Kyle has been able to establish from the archive records that only one die was made and that the three types represented the deterioration of the die. What is of interest is the sequence of the laying down of the master plate. Uh, the master plate consists of four groups of 120 cliches being sheets A, B and C, D. Uh, next slide. Thank you. Uh, 
it is apparent that the siderographer prepared sheets A and C concurrently as both contain types one and two, whereas sheets B and D only contain type two. However, only sheet C, and you're seeing half of sheet C on the screen now, includes type 1A. Uh, next slide, please. So this gives you an idea of the disbursement of the different types. Uh, and you can see that the siderographer started laying down at the bottom and worked upwards. And at the same time, he was laying down sheet A. And then later on, uh, he did the other two sheets. All right, next slide, please. Then to make up the numbers, I've come up with some uh, varieties that are not included in the specialist catalog. Uh, so I, I think that's fairly self-explanatory. And next slide, please. Uh, the one on the bottom left is in fact in the specialist catalog, but the, the, other, uh, the others aren't. Uh, but I'm sure Graham Floor has got all of that in hand. All right, yeah. thank you very much. Uh, Ted, we, Ted, when you're finished, uh, can you uh, email me a copy of each of those, please, so I can make sure I double check whether you're right or not? Okay. <laughs> It'll be, be my pleasure, Graham. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Um, any questions and or comments in regard to Ted? No? All right, well, our next presentation is by Richard Breck, and unfortunately, Richard's not uh, with us tonight. So I've got the pleasure of uh, presenting it for him. Okay, it's, it's 1942, a year of change. All right, this, this, this first uh, cover. Is uh is the is the hay penny um vortex uh, uh, example, and uh, although commonly called the hay penny vortex, the government's official name was the hay penny uh for postage. With the additional amount of postage to uh, to each postal article, with various exceptions, being allocated to the war effort. Domestic letters were carried by surface and air involved wall postage as indicated by a Melbourne to Sydney letter posted on the 13th of February 42. So this is this, this had this had a half the half the kangaroo uh, stamp for the postage, which was a day before the Allies had surrendered um, at Singapore. This next example is um, duplicate letters. So with the so with the end of the Australian's external airmail connections in 1942, mail to overseas destinations had to be carried by surface transport. A common business practice involved duplicate letters being posted sometime after the original letter, which ensured the duplicate was carried by a different ship to the, origin, uh, to the original letter. And Next example is no message uh, machine postmarks. So as you can see, there's no messages on this. And there was normally have slogans. So early in 40, 1942, the post office removed slogan messages from postmarks and it came to the attention of authorities that messages relating to the war effort had delayed the delivery of mail to Australian prisoners of war held in Germany, excuse me, Germany and, and Italy. And this next one is a uh, year of chart, which was uh, which was the identity cards. So in 1942, every Australian resident aged over 14 years was I issued with a personal identity card featuring their signature and place of residence and to be shown on demand to authorised per persons. Since the cards were carried by the holder when, when away from home, most have not survived in good condition today. These, these two, that, this one that are, which is uh, shown us is pretty good condition. Doesn't look like it's been in, oh, it's a few, a few uh, marks on top. All right, the next is uh, 
Poster rule number 10. I mean, I never knew anything about this until I read, you know, read uh, Richard's uh, presentation. Rule 10 in the wartime post office guide specified the circumstances in which money could be sent to overseas countries. So if the amount and destination of a letter contra contravened rule 10, its, tra its transmission was refused. So I assume that uh, this would have had a, some money in it to, uh, to be refused. And the last one, um, in turn email. People of enemy origin re resident in Australia could be interned during the war. This 1942 letter addressed to the Australian Jewish Welfare Society in Melbourne was sent from an internee at Tatura camp in Northern Victoria. Unlike enemy prisoners of war in Australia, uh, civilians, civilian internees had to pay, t pay postage on their mail within Australia. All right, any questions? Comments? No, all right, well, next is uh, John Shawley. John. Thank you, Frank. Um, I think most people will probably know that, that my family history uh, involves a number of the parts of the empire, variously Malaya, then the Bahamas, and then Nyasaland stroke Malawi. Um, so I've always had a particular interest in what those wild colonials did. Um, and now I'm in Victoria, and of course I'm, I'm completely surrounded by them. But uh, anyway, the good old days. So it's just some idea from postcards and a few photos that I've taken. So if we move on to the first, thank you, Frank. The first big challenge, of course, for people going to the colonies, I'll use that general expression, um, was getting there. Uh, the photo on the left is said to be 1852, but the quality of the photograph, the quality of movement and, and, and the foreground and the like makes me wonder whether that's right. But certainly the, the vessels, there's not a steamship in sight. Um, actually, the, there is a small craft that's a, a, a port craft um, on the right hand side tied up, but uh, that's not really what matters. So, so it could well be 1842, but these sort of vessels, six, eight weeks uh, to typically to get people to, to, to Mauritius. And so that's a photo of Mauritius Harbour. Um, the southern tip of Mauritius, uh, rather like King Island and those islands around Tasmania, some very treacherous waters. So um, there are an awful large number of wrecks around um, the, the, the Mauritius Island as there are around King Island. Um, so the, the picture at the top, I, 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 I've got a part of my postcard collection. Struck me as a, a funny selection for all Christmas best wishes. It's 1903, it's sent to the mayor and the corporation of Beaumaris. Now that is not Beaumaris as in Victoria, that's Beaumaris as in North Wales, but it, it just struck me as an odd selection of wishing people well for the new year and uh, a, a wrecked vessel and uh, rescuers on their way out to it. The other aspect uh, the, uh, on the lower card is, is uh, a wagon on its way from South Africa to Rhodesia. Cecil Rhodes had this great dream of Cape to Cairo. Um, so he sent off an awful lot of people under the aegis of the British South Africa company to uh, explore the route. They actually got to Rhodesia and found the conditions for agriculture so positive and so encouraging, they didn't go any further. So they, they, they stayed there. But uh, that is a, an image of, if you can barely see him, lying there, relaxing, hopefully having a, having a break um, while his wagon horses are somewhere else uh, feeding themselves up. But uh, I note there that the attacks by lions were one of the major hazards of this particular route. And I have New Nyasland newspapers where postmen were also considered quite tasty targets. Next one, thank you, Frank. Another part of the empire and the early part of it were the various services that were, were, were based there. On the left-hand side, the Mauritius governor is the one wearing the funny hat. Um, and by the way, the, 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 there's a, a, a lot of connections between uh, Victoria um, and, and, and Mauritius in the form of governors that went from one to the other. And he's looking at a, at a volunteer force of the army. Uh, on the right-hand side, there's the fleet in Port Louis Harbour, Harbour 
that always had been a, a fleet for a, a long time on the ocean and in the Indian Ocean on the east coast of Africa. Its original purpose was preventing the slave trade, uh, which was <coughs> very strongly related to the movement of, of, of slaves from the interior, from the Congo and indeed from Nyasaland um, up through Arabia um, and, and, and through the Persian Gulf. Um, so there was always a fleet there for quite a period, but this is a, a fleet in 1905 uh, based in, in Port Louis Harbour. Next one, thank you, Frank. The Brits um, found the heat fairly challenging, so they would very strongly try to find uh, places to cool off. And of course, we've got places like Mount Macedon outside Melbourne. Um, Sydney had, had its equivalent, Moss Vale. Uh, but this is on, on the uh, um, uh, Himalayan Railway at Darjeeling. It's the loop at the end of the line. So it was obviously a single line going up. So the train went up quite a lot, significant sized train. Um, and this is where the Brits went to uh, uh, cool off in the, in the Himalayas. This has got some philatelic uh, um, in, involvement, un, un, unlike most of the other things that I show, um, in that it ha has a sea post office mark, which is on the top left of the postcard. I've enlarged it at the bottom and courtesy of uh, Edward Proud, it was on the Oriental from Bombay on the 28th, Aden the 1st of January. So, um, and it was, it's the earliest known uh, sea post office, post office um, um, of that particular type, Mark, but uh, proud states are, are not particularly reliable. So I don't claim any great satisfaction with, with, with that. But it just struck me as a rather interesting, interesting card showing the, the, the loop for the train. Next one, thank you. In Nyasaland, the equivalent was going up to the lake. Uh, as you'll see on the slide that follows, uh, uh, Zomba, which was the, uh, a, a capital for running the government, uh, was fairly high anyway, and there was a high plateau uh, close by that was even higher, about 6,000 feet. Um, but the lake itself is, is still about 3,000 feet above sea level. Um, and the Brits go up, and uh, here is a hotel. From the cars, I would guess late 30s. Um, I find it quite fascinating, the fence. Um, I've got a number of images of this part of the lake. And one of the main challenges was the ingress of crocodiles and the thought of eating several Englishmen and English ladies could have been quite tempting for the crocodiles. So if one's, one is, is, is politically correct, one could say that's a crocodile fence. I think it's more likely to keep out the Africans. Um, the only th Africans that were welcome were those carrying a large tray with gin and tonics on them, and they were extremely welcome. Um, but it's interesting to me that there's virtually sort of three levels of barrier between something that looks like Brighton Beach, including deck chairs. So the English may go to Africa, but they don't actually always change as much as they might. The picture on the right is a much more modern one taken by, by myself on the lake a little bit further north than where that ho hotel is. It's a, it's a very attractive lake. Um, it's a very large lake, um, and it's the end of, 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 of the chain of lakes that goes down that east coast of Africa. But uh, the English, as ever, try to recreate home. Next slide. Thank you, Frank. Um, this is a, a, the, on the left-hand side is, is rather a charming drawing uh, drawn by a Mrs. C.C. Metcalf. And I actually, I've got quite a collection of that family correspondence. It was a series of her drawings that were used on the Nyasaland entries to the Empire Exhibition in London in 1927. The card has actually been used as part of one of these postcard clubs. Um, and it has imprimé uh, a stamp on the top centre to indicate that the stamp is on the, on, on the face side, which was quite often done on, on these cards. Uh, it, I think it's a very charming uh, picture from Zomba Plateau, which is at 6,000 feet. Um, on the right-hand side is a photograph that I took on, on a visit there from a particular uh, position, uh, location on, on the mountain called Queen Mother's Seat. I'm not quite sure whether the Queen Mother would appreciate this being called the Queen Mother's Seat, but it's a view very similar to the one that's on the left-hand side. 
um, you go up by a, a, a one direction track and you have to leave between the hour and the quarter past and you come back on the half hour to the quarter two. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating drive and it is very scenic. It's not a very other old photograph, so it doesn't do it justice, but uh, I think her card does a much better job of it. Last card then, thank you, Frank. Um, one of the things that Brits typically do, and I think it's quite good, and I like it, is they go local. So the postcard on the left-hand side shows Blantyre, which was the commercial capital, and the market. And you can see what a hive of activity it, it, it is. The photos on the right I, I took, and that's a Zomba market as it happens, but the arrangement's very, very similar. And you see that all everything is put into little piles. And each of those piles was a tiki's worth, a tiki being threepence. Um, so you knew exactly what you were getting for, for, for your money. Um, and that was the way that transactions were done. And it was a very efficient setup there because as soon as you'd done your shopping, you could go off and have a haircut. Um, that is not me being uh, having their haircut at the bottom, I might, might add, but... Uh, uh, it was a quaint and a very friendly and a very easy place. Malawi um, is a very friendly country. It's, a, it, it, it's well worth a visit and it's very, very scenic. Very, a lot of mountains um, and the lake. There are a lot to recommend it. Frank, that for what it's worth is my diversion from the heavy philately that has gone before and will follow me. So oh. just worthwhile people knowing that their council Attack, attack this hobby from a variety of directions. Thank you, Frank. Thanks, thanks, John. Any questions or comments for John? No, all right. Our next uh, on the agenda is uh, Alan Gray. Alan. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Right. Um, well, basically, um, I'm, I'm showing the uh, stamps of that were printed by, uh, for British New Guinea. British New Guinea set up a post office in 1887 and were under the administration of uh, Queensland until 1901, when British New Guinea actually printed their own stamps. And the three sheets that I'm showing tonight are in that period uh, when the British New Guinea stamps were on issue. Uh, they finished being on issue in 1906. So uh, in essence, it was a very short period of time. Um, after 1906, these stamps were overprinted Papua because Papua was then uh, um, prob promulgated uh, as the territory and um, they issued their own stamps a year or two later. But uh, the first set of um, covers that I show are to non-British empire um, destinations. And uh, my covers are basically based on uh, rates. So that's the first cover, our uh, first sheet. I only have three. Okay, Frank. This is the second uh, sheet that I have. And I point to the cover down in the right-hand corner. It's the only cover recorded from British New Guinea to Norway. And it was, um, the rate was a UPU rate of tuppence halfpenny, but it was only franked with a penny. So it was short a penny halfpenny. And um, the, um, that's the 15 cents tax. And of course, uh, double deficiency made it 30 cents um, and the 24 in blue crayon is actually 24 or which is eight or per per penny which comes out at threepence um, that's the only cover from british new guinea to norway um, the uh, postage due stamps are on the back of the cover and that's on the left righto frank And the final sheet I've got is for mail to Australia. And um, there's um, some interesting covers here. The one up on the left-hand corner is uh, from uh, Tomata. 
a registered cover and the uh, postmark there was not in in uh, black ink so much as it was a, a very, very uh, waxy sort of ink. And we think that uh, they used um, water to uh, make the ink go further. Um, down in the right hand corner is a bisect. Um, believe it or not, the other half of that bisect is in, still in existence. Um, and uh, uh, there are only six copies of the Woodlark's BNG uh, postmark uh, recorded, and this is one of them. But um, th that is mailed to Australia. Um, thank, uh, the, these three sheets are in my exhibit, which is going, going to be in London 2022, that uh, uh, Charles and... Uh, and Stephanie are taking to London. Thanks, Frank. Thank you, Alan. Any questions or comments for Alan? No, well, next, the next person in line is uh, Peter Leach. Over to you, Peter. Okay, mine six sheets are male to do with the Chinese missionaries in China. Um, <coughs> now the first one there, don't get excited, Frank. It's not a true first day cover. It was posted a few days after the first day of issue. Of the Ten Senate days war. after. Ten days after then. Um, but it's interesting because it's ended up in in northern China at a, a school set up for the missionary families. And during the Japanese occupation, the school was taken over by the Japanese and all the students and teachers and parents were interned in the school. For the duration. Um, so that's that one. And the top one's just a typical sort of Chinese land mission cover, went through French Indochina on its way to England and censored by the French and censored, censored by the British at Singapore. Um, and then you go to the next sheet, next sheet, um, which is the uh, the Quakers' activities in China. Um, they were all granted exemption from military service. And what they did to get around that was they set up ambulance units, particularly in China. Um, and it's interesting that the, the top covers address for Gordon Square, London. Um, that address still exists. There's actually a church on the corner there and the church was built originally as the, the place that the Lord is going to come back to, to visit us mere mortals. And it's quite a fancy church if you go and check it out. Um, it's near Tavistock Square, um, just over, quite close to the hotel we stay at when we go to London. It's close to like Russell Square Station, so you get the tube in from the airport into Russell Square, direct line. So it's quite convenient, but it's quite an inter interesting church if you do get the chance to see it. Um, next one. And not only the British, but there's quite a few different nationalities. One was the Canadian mission. Um, they also set up a hospital in India. So this is male between the two. Um, again, they've all been censored. Um, these both were censored in India going into China. If they got the next one. On that previous one, I got the note there that there were, uh, by 1932, they had set up 254 mission hospitals in China. So the Canadians are quite active. Um, and quite of those mission hospitals still existed. The commissioners took, out, took them over and enlarged the hospitals. Um, Next one is the current one on the show is the London Missionary Society. Um, again, the, the address in Calcutta where the top or the two covers were going to is now a major hospital in Calcutta, originally set up by the London Missionary Society and um, taken over by the Indians. And the next is the Church of Christ in China. 
Um, this was an amalgamation of various churches in, in China. Um, and by 1937, when they held their fourth general assembly in Xintao, um, they had 2,842 local churches in China. They still have one church left, that's in Hong Kong. And I don't know how long that will last, the way things are going in Hong Kong. It brings us to the final cover. And we come back to an Australian connection. This is as I had a bishop to archbishop. Um, there's two letters from what was then the Anglican Bishop of Western China, um, Ching Shi Shong, um, to the Archbishop of Sydney, um, who himself had been the Bishop of Western China prior to his appointment in Sydney. Um, and Mowell's final, or probably one of his major achievements in Sydney was to set up a, a rural retirement, at that time a rural retirement um, venue for retired missionaries. Um, it's now in Castle Hill, which is part of suburban Sydney. There are my six sheets. Well, you didn't tell me to keep on going because I... So. <laughs> I've got it. Any, any questions for the... Yes, I have a question, please, Frank. Yep. I want to ask Peter why the covers were censored in 1920. I wasn't aware there were any wars on at that stage. Um, 1920? I didn't think I had a 1920 cover. Uh, about your second sheet. Um, they are during the Second World War. Oh, they are. Oh, OK. Yep. Sorry, got it wrong. Yeah, not a problem. Any other questions or comments? No, well, then it's... I've, I'll got, I've, got, I've got several thousand covers in that period in China. So they're all telling a story. All right. Thanks, Peter. Well, right, I'm, I'm next. Yeah. And, and I've got a very modern uh, presentation. <laughs> Australia Post localised um, prepaid postcards. Now, to give you some background to uh, the prepaid postcards, Australia Post don't generally advertise any any most things that they do. And uh, we came across this by uh, me accident. Um, Bernie, Bernie Beston, who likes to go to post offices and, and that and get postcards and postal stationery, things like that, and see what's out there, send us a postcard saying, uh, this is a new Bundaberg postcard. There's five of us in the group who, you know, in between, the, you know, Victoria, Queensland, ACT, New South Wales, we all go to the post office and see what that, what's new in the new postcards, and especially the postcards, and I collect the prepaid postcards. And he sent us a Bundaberg one. No one's ever seen it. Questions were asked, so we asked, so I asked Cheryl Boy at Australia Post, and. Uh, she says, "Oh, that's a new campaign that we. It's, it's a new campaign we're doing for uh, post offices to uh, promote promote their uh, towns to uh, tourists. So in September 2019, what happened? Australia Post launched its localised products, and the products in the you know, range included uh, coasters, mugs, tote bags, drink bottles, and as well as these prepaid postcards." And as you can see, there's two photographs that were taken. One of the Adelaide GPO with its localised postal um, uh, product stand. And the one on the right is the Warnable Post Office with its local um, souvenirs. All right, so, this, so the, the, the first batch that was uh, launched uh, was uh, there were 11 stores, which were corporate stores. Um, they were uh, Port, Port Macquarie, Sydney, Melbourne, Bendigo, Warrnambool, Swan Hill, Brisbane, Perth, and Perth uh, and uh, Broome, Geraldton and Broome. So how, how this process works? Uh, images of post, uh, images of uh, sites, you know, around around the towns were um, supplied by the relevant post offices to Australia Post. There was an image agreed between the two, you know, between head office Australia Post and the, the, uh, the post office. And 
then the uh, postcard was uh, printed. All the orders were done online. And as you can see, the, 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 the two postcards that I'm showing here is uh, Melbourne and Warnable, uh, which was one of the original post offices. Um, all, the, all, the, all these postcards um, have the same barcode. General, generally, when uh, Australia Post produces a postcard, it only has uh, every every postcard has different barcode for, for retail sale. Whereas these postcards um, have the same barcode with the four four eight four five five uh, number. So the only difference on the, on, on the uh, address side is uh, the uh, description of the image on the front. Then about December 2019, they've, you know, they did their initial launch to the 11 post offices. They, uh, the uh, localised po product range was uh, released to all the corporate post offices. And um, by, the end, by, the, by March 2020, uh, there was about 100 post offices um, who had the localised postcards. And that, that's the Bundaberg post off, uh, postcard that uh, Bernie had sent us originally, and that's uh, and the, on the one on the right is the Katoomba uh, post office postcard. So then in uh, March 2020, localized language was released to all post offices, including uh, licensed post office LPOs, and which uh, and there were approximately an additional 50 post offices by the end of uh, 2020. And then by the end of 2021, there's another 70 you know, post office that have taken up the uh, localised product range. Unfortunately, Australia Post um, do not keep a record of any of these uh, uh, postcards. <laughs> so there's nothing in their archives, as we, as we know. Um, uh, we, we try to get some people going around the place to get them. But the, uh, most of the ones that we've received now have, been, have come from Cheryl and Spring Pack, so, which doesn't mean that they're all, um, that we've got them all. But so I think up until 2021, so you've got 70, 100, you got, there's about 220 po post offices that use the localised post uh, product range. They've got, and some of them have four or five different postcards for that particular post office. So. Um, they could, you know, there could be thousands out there. Um, in June 2020, um, the philatelic group decided to use some of the images uh, from the localised post office for their uh, postcard range. And so what happens is uh, they used the image that, that the local, the localised post office used and they made it a postcard for the, for the, for the, for the product range. And as you can see, this is, uh, the Sydney one, um, the image on the right has been expanded to make to make the postcard the full postcard, and these uh, the product right the the general product range, every postcard has got its own uh, product code, so it's distinguished uh, that way. So that's the end of my slide. Is there any comments, questions? Yep, Frank. How many of these have you seen commercially used? Three. <laughs> Including one from Bundaberg? No, uh, yes. Oh, he's on a mission. They'll be, hard to find. They'll, be very, they'll be very hard to find. Remember so when they're... Australia Post issued those postcard wallets? Oh, yeah. In the 1970s, no, sorry, late 70s and early 80s. Yeah, the blue yeah. one and the red wallet, I think it was. Oh, and, and, and a black wallet, I think I said blue, red, you know, whatever. Yeah. But, so um, they're hard to find commercially used as well. I've been, I've been trying to get a lot of those over the years. And it, I, everyone, anyone I see on eBay or anywhere, I, I um, buy, and I've got 25. Wow. The, the Australia Post website has less than 60 listed yeah. at the moment. Yeah, and, they're, and, they're, and, they're, and that's their product range. Mm. So the Australia Post website does not list the local, those lo localised postcards. These are only available at, at the individual post office, wherever they are, Melbourne, Sydney, um, Wonderburg or whatever. So you can't get them from Australia Post as such. You've got to go, actually go to that post office and purchase them. 
You'll never know. Phone uh, call to the Bundaberg Post Office. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of out of the way towns there, you know, like I think one of them was the Woi Woi walking track. Well, there's no post office at the Woi Woi walking track. You know, so there'll be a, be a licensed uh, LPO that's done, you know, th th done the postcards to uh, promote promote uh, the region to the tourists. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. how many of you out there knew about these? No. No, nobody. That's what I mean. <laughs> I've seen them in a post office once. <laughs> are they still available, Frank, or or, or they? Yeah, they're, yeah, they're continue? still they're, they're still they're, yeah. they're, they're available at you know if you go to the Melbourne GPA, you get the Melbourne one. Yeah. If you go to the Sydney, you know, Sydney GPA, you get the you know, the Sydney one. If you go, you know, any of those post offices that you know that I've listed, and there's you know there's another two hundred odd. They're there. You can buy them, but you can't get it like you, like if you're a collector of postcards like I am. Can't get them from the Philatelic Bureau. That's just nuts. <laughs> and they can't tell you numbers either. And they can't tell me numbers, and they can't tell me tell, <laughs> tell me which post office issued them. <laughs> so, you know, in, in in years in years down the track, you know, these are, you know some of these will be the you know, rare, rare, modern modern rarities. Not already. Yeah, exactly. All right. Any other comments in regards to any of the any of the uh, displays we've had tonight, or questions? Some you know, people would like to ask. Jeez, I'd just like to comment, if I may, Frank. Yes. I think it was a wonderful variety to see the the various things that the, all the different members of the council came up with. So I thought it was great. Good variety. No, it was. No, it was excellent. All right, if any, no other comments or questions, uh, we'll move uh, on with the rest of the meeting, some of the formalities and announcements. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank all the council members for putting such a hard effort in uh, putting together the presentations, like Ian said and a few other people have said. We've had a diverse variety. You know, we've had colonies to you know, my modern postcards, you know, and we all collect differently. We all collect different things. You know, we don't, don't collect just one a particular topic or subject, we collect a lot of varied things. So, and it's shown us, that, you know, that's shown us that, you know, we do collect all of this. So, I do thank council members for uh, their presentations and putting the effort in. So, thank you very much. Some of the announcements. The first, first announcement I have uh, real pleasure in announcing is um, that one of our STEAM members, uh, Malcolm Groom, who's here tonight with us has been invited to uh, sign the role of Distinguished okay. Philatelist. So, Malcolm, on behalf of the Society and members and above, all well, the councils on, we really we, we congratulate you on a really well-deserved award. So, thank you very much, Frank. Um, with, with Malcolm, there were four, there were four other um, uh, Members of the Royal um, asked to be asked to sign the Royal, the, the uh, Royal of the Timish Flat List. Uh, uh, Bruno, hopefully I can uh, pronounce all these names correctly. Uh, Dr. Bruno Gravato, Gravato Savaghi from Italy. Ronaldo Estivo de Macedo from uh, Brazil. The rest of the these other two I can pronounce. Uh, Hugh Free uh, Feldman from the United Kingdom. And uh, Patricia Walker, yeah. most of us, I think, know Patricia um, from the USA. So mm. I congratulate yeah. those members as well. A well deserved um, award. And husband and wife, Auntie Beats. Ooh. Yeah, they both are. They are. Must be yeah. the, I think that might be the first. It probably is. I, I, I know, I know um, Dan said to me that uh, when he got his, uh, Pat wasn't too happy because he was <laughs> for her. <laughs> <laughs> and I understand that there are four live within the stone throw of each other. Peter McCann, Dan yep. and Pat Walker, and Jim Mazep are all live within two of each other. <laughs> yeah. They must breed them well up there. <laughs> um, also, I'll yeah, like, say that the, um, the, 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 signing, the, the signing ceremony, which is um, on Monday, the 21st of February 2022, uh, you can attend by um, Zoom. Uh, 
the um, the RPSV has uh, made it available for Zoom, uh, and I think that the Zoom, the Zoom link is available on their or, or the RPSV website. Ian, do you would you know any more about that, Mr. Greg? Welcome. You're muted. No, I, no, I know nothing at all. In fact, uh, I didn't even know the data yeah. until you just said it. <laughs> Malcolm, didn't you say they weren't presenting it to you then? No, I'm not able to get there this You're time. Not able to get there. So, yeah. I'm trying so, to trip it. But so you I can think, join by Zoom, and yeah. if you're happy to get up at 4 a.m. in the morning to do it, you... yeah, that's right. Frank, well, I, 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 I suspect we... it's together with the Palmaris for the London exhibition, which is actually not a Palmaris, but which is a Royal yeah. of London dinner. Yeah, I think I, I don't know. It's 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 at it's at 5:30 p.m., so I don't think it will be yeah. the Palmaris. So I think It'd they're be having a, 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 separate, a separate day. This is, on, this is on a Monday, the 21st of February, so... Yeah. Um, Frank, I think important, important to point out, by the way, if you attend Zoom, you'll need to wear a black tie. <laughs> I've already I've cleared that with the secretary. I've asked what the dress code was. He said, as long as the top half dress code's proper, it doesn't matter what you've got underneath. <laughs> Beryl says you don't have to wear your pants, Malcolm. <laughs> as long as I don't stand up. Yeah. yeah, but but I I think what the I think what the uh, norm is um if you're not there to get presented you get presented at the next um um award, yeah. the next award you, so, or next the RDP signing so well you physically have to sign it so you have that's to right there. exactly yeah so but well, this year I think they've got 2020 and 2021 awardees being uh, uh, RDP signing the award so right. yeah so anyway anyway congratulations Malcolm thank you appreciate that. Oh, no, it's on Friday the 25th. No, oh, sorry, there are two functions. Um, I just looked it up. The <coughs> other one's on the 25th of February. So, yeah, yeah, so the RTP is separate. It's separate. Yeah. All right. Any general business from anybody? Anything to announce? Didn't you know, I think there's not much philately going out, going out, 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 out the, uh, the world at the moment. Frank, are you going to comment on the day meeting and the and the, oh, uh, that's next. That's next. Okay, sorry. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, as, as John said, the future future meetings because the library will be will be open uh, on um, Saturday the twenty ninth of January at two p.m. Richard Brecken will be will be there to open it. So um, just make sure if you attend, you um, sign sign in with your smartphone or register on or register on the sheet, and make sure you wear a mask. Well, um, the daytime meeting and the poster history group uh, will be will be meeting, but it all, all depending on um, what's happening with COVID out there. Graham and John will be let will let um, the normal the usual uh, suspects um, know if the meeting's on um, by, by email. So just keep an eye out on the email and on the website. I'm having so you. You're the first one, Graham, on the 1st of February, so yes. you normally we're send out an email. Yeah, we're scheduled to be a member's six-sheet uh, display, so at the moment uh, <clears throat> I'm intending to go ahead with it, but it depends on uh, what everybody thinks, I think, really. Yeah. It's, it's, it's all a bit confusing at the moment. It, it is, it is. And, John, have you got any topic that's going to be on Postal History? or? <laughs> I can't, yeah, rem was... can't remember, actually. I'm right was that long ago? Else. It was holidays, John. Holidays. holidays. Good on you, Graham. That's good. <laughs> Glad that somebody concentrates. Well done. Thanks, Graham. And um, and our next philatelic meeting on the 17th of February, um, we have got Tim Roger from Mildura, who uh, will be presenting his Australian <laughs> inaugural decimal definitive stamps post we use. So everyone just keep an eye out. I, I will be sending an, e an email or circular in the first week of February anyway. Um, and hopefully by then we'll know a bit more. But just keep an eye on the emails and, and the website and just to see, you know, if um, we can't have, you know, we decided we can't have a uh, face-to-face meeting. Uh, we'll have a Zoom meeting. I've got someone in mind to do uh, present a Zoom for us. Well, that's uh, So we'll definitely, uh, we'll have a meeting either way. Either will be a face-to-face -face with two Rogers or another Zoom meeting that night. All right, anything else? 
Hank, have you got any news on the Melbourne exhibition later this year? Is that the Melbourne yeah. exhibition later on this year is is going ahead so far? Thank you. Depending on what you know what happens, we have got until March to uh, decide whether to postpone or cancel it. But as far as, as far as we're concerned, and Australia Post is concerned, um, where it's, it's a go at from you know for September. Thank you. Just to mention, Frank, the Collectors Club in New York is looking at selling their premises and moving to some more a, a newer, more practical uh, environment. And uh, they went through a whole series of reasons that was like a rerun of the move from Avoca Street to Ashford. <laughs> I think I think a few clubs, a few older clubs, are doing that. The, build, the buildings are getting too too expensive to uh, do repairs or renovate. Their, their main problem is that it's got stairs to go in, steps to go in. Mm. Uh, they've got a limited lift, and uh, it, it's just really not compatible with with a, an older membership. They have, apparently have one toilet on one level. It it really isn't a fit for purpose um, a property these days. Well, it sounds like a Vaca Street when we were moving. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. Any, any other comments or? Nothing. Well, thank you everyone for um, joining us. I think we, in, in the end, we ended up having 22, 23 members. So it was really, really good. And we, we did have an overseas member. So thank you, Ian, for joining us. And um, so thank you, everyone. I will hopefully, hopefully we'll see you in February face to face. If not, um, we'll have a Zoom. So uh, good night okay. and um, enjoy. Okay. And stay, stay, stay healthy. Farewell. Thank you, Frank. Okay. Hold on. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.